If traditional budgeting is the calorie counting of personal finance, then the anti-budget is the intuitive eating of personal finance. That's Paula Pant, host of the popular Afford Anything podcast and also a successful entrepreneur and real estate investor. I am the small and mighty real estate investor. (laughs) Currently, I have seven rental units, all of which are paid off free and clear. In addition to being a savvy investor herself, Paula is the best I know at explaining how to think about money and how to actually achieve financial freedom. You know, money is a physical manifestation of your values. In this episode, you'll learn the common psychological barriers that get in the way of our financial progress. Money is the root of all evil, which is kind of like saying a hammer is the root of all thumb injuries. The one most important concept to grow your wealth faster. If you make, say, 100000 a year, and you increase your income to 150000 a year, it might be easier to achieve than trying to cut $35,000 out of your spending. And Paula has a new acronym for the FIRE movement, Financial Independence Retire Early. I think of the acronym FIRE, and I have my own definition. And now we're going to dig into all of that and more. One of the things I respect a lot about you as a friend, as a content creator, is you're a deep thinker. I would Thank call you. you I would call you a philosopher, modern day philosopher. <laughs> and this is a podcast about money and people are interested in money. And one of the things I think you articulate better than anyone I know is the first principles of money, of how we could think about it, how we can use it. And so I'd love to unpack that a little bit more and just get your insights on that. And the first question that I think just a good place to start is your philosophy around afford anything about this, mm. uh, your, the name of your brand and and, and what that means. And so can you unpack that a little bit, explain to people why afford anything? Afford anything is the notion that you can afford anything, but not everything. So it is the notion of opportunity cost and trade-offs. And oftentimes those opportunity costs are invisible. Often when we are presented with a given opportunity, we consider that opportunity in a vacuum rather than thinking about the trade-offs required in order to make that opportunity work. And this applies to not just money, but time, focus, energy, attention, to the allocation of any limited resource. So for example, we might think about, do I want to purchase this house? We think about that decision in a vacuum. Can my budget allow it? Do I want to live in this area, etc.? But we may or may not think about the ramifications of that on something like spending a year in Latin America with your wife and two kids, as I know you have personal experience doing, right? We may not think about the ramifications that that has on some hobby that we love and that we want to put a lot of time and money into. Like, let's say you're a very avid rock climber or an avid surfer. All All of these financial decisions have inherent trade-offs. The same is true with our time and with our energy. There are many times that people will approach me with a business opportunity or a business idea and they'll outline like, hey, here are all the ways that this particular opportunity, opportunity X, could help your business grow or could make you more money. That's maybe true, but that speaks to the hypothesis that it has any benefit and not the maximum benefit, to paraphrase a concept coined by Dr. Cal Newport. The any benefit hypothesis means, yeah, sure, it might be good, but is it the optimal use? That's really what Afford Anything speaks to. I think what strikes me about that, the idea, what the reason is I think it's so deep is that it is about money. It includes money, but this is more, I feel like you can apply this to so many parts of your life. You mentioned time, mentioned energy. This is really like a life philosophy. And one of the things I've tried to do with my own platform is to make it about bigger than real estate investing, bigger than money. This for my slogan or kind of cash line is do what matters and do what matters in your life. And I've heard you speak about this and I think you articulate it really well that your decisions that you're saying, these trade-offs that you have, they're more than about money. They're that your money decisions are about your values in life, what's important to you. So can you speak to that a little bit? Because I think that's that value idea and aligning your life and your decisions with values resonates with me a lot. So the framework that I like to use is I like to uh, imagine a tree. The roots of a tree are your values. That is the thing that keeps you rooted. It anchors you to the ground. And so maybe you value, for example, adventure and travel and novelty, maybe that's core to your values. Or maybe conversely, maybe you value stability and stability and security. Maybe that's core to your values. So I'm not telling you what your values are. That's up to each individual. But whatever those values are to you, those are your roots. Now, stemming up from those roots, the trunk of the tree, those are your guiding principles, which stem or derive from your values. And based on those guiding principles, you have 
a vision for the future, which is another way of saying you have a set of goals and dreams. That's the tree trunk and it grows out of the roots. Now, how do you achieve those goals and dreams? Those are the branches of the tree, the big, strong branches. And that's the strategy. Once you have that strategy formed, which are the big branches, how do you then execute upon that strategy. Those are the twigs. Those are the tactics. And finally, what tools do you need in order to implement those tactics? Those are the leaves, right? That's the leaf canopy because the tools that you use, the leaves are the last to form and the first to fall. It's quite literally in the formation of a tree, the last thing that a tree, that a growing tree thinks about. And yet in the world of real estate investing and personal finance, both, we often make the mistake of starting with the tools and the tactics, with the leaves and the twigs. We start there because it's the most visible. As an outside observer looking at a tree, the most visible part of a tree structure are the leaves. That's what we see. We don't see the roots that are buried underground. We don't see the trunk that is maybe hidden underneath a big leaf canopy. We see the leaves and And so naturally we end up starting with the question of which leaves do I need? Do I need this piece of software? Do I need that app? Should I start an LLC? We really, we start there. That's like trying to grow a tree by planting a leaf rather than planting a seed. You and I both get a lot of questions and I would say that nine times out of 10, it's a tactics question. It's a leaf question. It's a twig question. It's a, should I do house hacking? Should I invest the money in the stock market? Which are great questions. Like I, I like those questions, but I think the point, the thing that strikes me about this is that if you're not clear on the trunk, then it's kind of like Alice in Wonderland. Like any any path will take you there, right? Like whichever path you want to take, what app do you want to use? Like pick, a, pick an app, who cares? So I, I'm curious if you have some stories from your own life. I always remember your story in your twenties when you traveled abroad and and you were just getting started and you chose adventure, for example, to go and do some things. And you had friends telling you that like, what are you doing? Like, I'd love to do that, but you know, I couldn't do that. You can explain that story. I think that would demonstrate so much about this idea of aligning afford anything. Like you can afford anything, but you can't afford everything. But also this idea of values. I'm curious what at that point in your life, what were you thinking about? What were you valuing that can influence you to go that route? In my early twenties, I was a newspaper reporter straight out of college, straight out of undergrad. I became a newspaper reporter and I worked there for a handful of years. Over the span of three years, I saved a total of $25,000. And once I had that in the bank, I quit my job, bought a one-way plane ticket to Cairo, Egypt. And for the next 27 months, I lived out of a backpack and just traveled around the globe. I freelanced a little bit while I was traveling, but I was working maybe about five hours a week. So it was very, very part-time. I made, I stretched the money by going to countries where the dollar exchange rate really worked in my favor. So I spent the bulk of my time in Southeast Asia, in Laos, in Cambodia, in Vietnam, in Myanmar, in places where I could geo-arbitrage the value of the US dollar versus the value of the Laotian kip. And during that time, my friends almost universally said the same thing, which is, I would love to do something like that, but I can't afford it. I heard that refrain over and over and over. And yet I knew that those same friends were making significantly more than me in their jobs. I was a newspaper, or I had been a newspaper reporter prior to that trip. Entry-level news reporters for local newspapers don't make very much money. Like news flash. Journalism is not a field that you typically go into if you're looking to make money. And so I knew that they made significantly more than me in their jobs, but I knew that they also spent quite a bit more than me. They had apartments with stainless steel appliances. They had cars that they leased that were less than two years old. They would go to the bar and buy a $14 cocktail. And I'm not disparaging those choices. If you sit down and you consciously make the decision, my day-to-day life is very important to me. Uh, Again, this goes back to the roots, right? Maybe you value stability and you think, you know what? My day-to-day life in my hometown or in the town in which I live is the most important thing to me and I want to really enjoy it. And so I am going to prioritize stainless steel appliances and a nice car and getting $14 cocktails with my buddies at the bar uh, on a Friday night. I'm consciously deciding that I am willing to give up traveling the world in order to have those things. If that's a conscious choice, I applaud that. But that then does not render the statement, I'd love to do that but I can't afford it. That renders the statement, I thought about doing that and I chose not to. And those are very different energies that you bring to a statement. One is an energy of disempowerment, an energy of I can't, I'm stuck. The other is, hey, I've really consciously, deliberately thought through this and I've chosen that X is a priority while Y is not a priority. And when you look at it through that lens, that the choices you made with the money, it's not your only choices you make in your life, but they are pretty significant choices. Every day we're spending money in that way, you're 
reflecting your values based on how you've already spent your money, whether that was conscious or whether that was unconscious. If you choose to do that, and again, no judgment either way, but what a good exercise. Like I found like when my wife and I first uh, got married, one of the best things we did was actually like sitting down and talking money, which, you know, seems kind of boring, but it brought up values. It brought up conversations. It brought up some conflicts. It brought up some issues about money. And I, I find it such a useful tool in that respect. If you don't put it on too lofty of a pedestal and say, this is the most important thing in the world, money, or disparage it and say, this doesn't matter at all, but actually having just an honest, open conversation about it. And then using almost like a meditation tool, like, all right, what, what am I spending my money on? That's what I'm doing now. What would I like to spend my money on? And in your case, that was a big aha moment because at least in your case, you said, I, I value adventure at this point in my life, I value travel. Therefore, I'm going to spend lavishly on that. But the nice apartment, that kind of stuff, not important to me at this point in my life. So I'm not going to spend it. Exactly. You know, money is a physical manifestation of your values. That is how I would define money because money is obtained by trading your, your life trading away your, your time, your energy, your cognitive bandwidth, right? You exchange that for money and then you use that money as a tool to obtain whatever it is that matters to you most. And so in that regard, money is this very physical representation of your set of values. And to what you mentioned earlier, you don't want to either worship or disparage money. Don't imbue it with too much money is everything or money is nothing. I think that that most often happens when people conflate the means with the end. They conflate the tool with what the tool is used for. Money is fundamentally, it's like a hammer. You may value a home. A, a hammer is simply a tool that helps build that home. So you don't either worship or disparage the hammer or the forklift or the drill. Those are just tools that allow you to build the home that you want. Likewise, there are also tools that can hurt. You can use a hammer to jam your thumb or you can use a hammer to build a home with no injuries. So either way, you know, it, it isn't the hammer's fault. Well, let's continue your metaphor. Let's assume people, and I, I recommend people go to do the exercise of thinking about your values, writing them down. Actually, let me ask you that question. Like if somebody says, wow, that, that makes a ton of sense to me. I've never even like equated my money with my values. Like, do you have a, a recommendation on an exercise or maybe a path they could take to try to start getting clear on what those root yeah. values are for them so that they can make better decisions with yeah, their money? My recommendation would be to actually sit down and, and draw that tree that I uh, described earlier. Actually draw out, and you don't have to be a great artist. This is just for you. It doesn't need to be a beautiful artist rendering of a tree. Stick trees are okay. <laughs> All right. Good. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Stick figure trees are okay. But draw out that tree and then draw a horizontal line. Draw a few. Draw one from the roots. Draw one from the lower part of the trunk. The lower part of the trunk representing your principles. The higher part of the trunk representing the dreams and goals and aspirations which emerge from those principles. So roots, values, lower trunk, principles, upper trunk, dreams, goals, aspirations, the big branches, strategy, the small branches and twigs, tactics, and then the leaves tools. I would actually sit down, draw out the tree, draw a horizontal line at each of those points and fill in the blank as to where that fits in your life. And if you have a spouse or a partner or a significant other, then have them do the same exercise separately. Don't copy off one another's answers. Each of you do the exercise independently and then come together to talk about your answers because you'll find some commonalities and some differences. Such a helpful exercise. Love it. Hope people will do that. I want to get at some tactics actually, the, some of the leaves and the branches. I think, I think those are interesting, but I, I want to have another conversation about something you talk about a lot in your podcast, which is instead of starting with the tactics, continuing with this idea of the, the trunk of the tree is to think about the the psychology of money and the, your mindset around money and how I've heard you say that influences the tactics as much as anything, but how, how your, your mindset and specifically there's, you've talked about the different archetypes or maybe stories people tell themselves about money. I found that really fascinating. Can you unpack that a little bit? And, and I want to maybe do a little bit of digging on myself and other people I know. So like, what are my natural archetypes or tactics when it comes to my story about money. So when it comes to the psychology of money, there are a few archetypes or camps that people fall into. There are those who have a great deal of money negativity. And so maybe you have internalized these messages from society of money is the root of all evil, which is not actually the biblical quote. The quote is the love of money is the root of all evil. But people often mishear that your money is the root of all evil, which is kind of like saying a hammer is the root of all, <laughs> you know, all thumb injuries. Yes. Right? So, but maybe you've internalized that. And there are these 
social messages where depictions of people who are rich or successful, uh, those people are often considered evil. So look at the cartoon, The Simpsons, the character Montgomery Burns, evil. You look at DuckTales, you know, Scrooge McDuck, evil. You look at Charles Dickens, Ebenezer Scrooge, he's wealthy, but he's miserly. And so in all types of pop culture and media, whether it's modern cartoons or whether it's a classic Charles Dickens, time and time again, we see these images of wealthy or rich people who are vilified. They are the villains in the story. And it's natural for us to internalize that and think, well, I don't want to be the villain in this story. I don't want to be evil. Therefore, I'm going to reject money. I'm going to not be rich because that means that I am therefore a good person. So there's this notion that there is nobility in poverty. Poverty I'm I'm using not in the literal sense, in more of a storytelling sense, in the pop culture sense of the word. That there is nobility in not being the rich one in the room, in not being the character of Benny from the musical Rent. Or even show apathy about it. Like if you're in the room, if you can display that I'm kind of apathetic about money, money doesn't matter to me, that 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 sort of aligns you with that pattern. You know, you're showing that that money, yeah, money is not that important to me. My art's important. My job, my something else is money, not a big deal. Exactly. There's a level of virtue signaling that comes with, oh, I'm not interested in money. It comes from, I'm not interested in money because I'm not materialistic, which actually takes a bit of a cognitive jump because now you're jumping from money, which is a tool to materialistic, which is, it implies the acquisition of luxury items, such as maybe luxury cars, luxury homes, clothing, etc. The acquisition of luxury items is one of many possible uses for money. You could use money to buy a bunch of luxury items. You could use money to just hoard it in a bank account. You could use it to make investments. You could use it to start a nonprofit. You could use it to buy 700,000 pairs of eclipse glasses. I mean, you could use it for literally anything you want. It's a bit of a logical fallacy to conflate money with one of many possible uses for money. That one of many possible uses being materialism. But the archetype of money negativity, that ties in with um, one of many, when it comes to the conversation around the psychology of money, there are so many people who have internalized money negativity that that internalized sense of money negativity, money is bad, money is the root of all evil, leads to self-sabotage and leads to really a person holding themselves back. Conversely, there is also money worship. There's the, the notion that some people have that their value as a human being is the same thing as the net worth that they've accumulated. So this is the opposite of money negativity. It is my self-worth is my net worth. And by the way, just to give credit to where credit is due, a lot of these constructs come from Dr. Brad Klontz, who is a financial psychologist. Money worship is this notion that, again, my my self-worth and my net worth are inextricable. I deserve to be a human being to the extent that I make money and can provide for my family. I think you you see a lot of these pressures. Frankly, I think you see a lot of it, particularly in, in young men who are unfortunately often taught, I think erroneously, that their value comes from what they can accumulate and build rather than who they are. Many people unfortunately are taught that your value is not, are you a kind and compassionate person? Are you a loving person in this world? But rather, have you hustled? What have you built? What have you done? What have you achieved? What have you accomplished? And that's where a lot of money worship can come in. This particular archetype, I think we all might have our own tendencies. Coming from the sports background, coming from you hustle, you work hard, you do that. This is definitely one that I still struggle with. And I think the most helpful thing that I've heard you talk about, and maybe I'll have to check out Dr. Brad Klontz's work as well, but it's just when you can identify what it is. Like, so money's a tool, money's the hammer. These other things like achievement or making progress progress, you know, those are separate things that money is often connected with. Just the act of like looking at them separately in my mind and saying, okay, my self-worth as a human being, money in my bank account, accomplishing this thing, all separate things that, that you can see that there's multiple paths to get to some of these. And it's just, to me, it's like that unconscious connecting. I have money, I'm doing a lot of business, therefore I feel good about myself and my inner self-worth is all connected to that. When it's unconscious, that's when it gets troublesome. For me, like the kind of background emotion was anxiety. And I tell this story when I went on my first big kind of mini retirement walkabout in 2009 with my wife, I was not financially independent, but like you, I saved up like 20,000 bucks. We left, I got my systems down enough to where I could leave and have the rental properties not implode. I wasn't going to financially fail. And then I just got out and I'm like, all right, let's go to Spain. Let's do this. I was learning Spanish. It took me six weeks, literally. I know exactly where I was, the coast of Spain and Cadiz, And it was like this, ironically, it was this place where they were uh, Salvador Dali did a lot of these surrealistic paintings and it's just kind of crazy, craggy coast. And my 
my wife and I were sitting there on this in this bench reading and just kind of chilling out, watching the sunset over the Mediterranean coast. There's this big, huge green meteor that like shot across the sky right after the sunset. And I'm like, oh my, like what's going on here? Like, is this some kind of sign? And but at that moment, I felt like this release of this anxiety that I didn't even know was there. It was like a knot was untying in my chest. Physically felt that. And looking back on it, it was anxiety. It was like just me always wanting to go, go, go. And me sitting there calmly for six weeks doing other things that were not climbing and not building and not kind of A-type activities was really difficult. It was a withdrawal symptom almost. I guess I'm just pointing out that, you know, that, that one definitely resonated with me. And for me, is the ongoing struggle. It's separating myself physically from the building, from the climb is what is helpful for me. It takes me out of that environment so that I can kind of see it for what it is and look back at it and say, okay, that's the business that I built. That's the wealth that I'm building. That's not Chad. That's this thing that I, I'm doing. This is me in another place thinking about the business that I built. And the mini retirement for me was like, that was the huge gem of the process because it sort of forced me to get from the unconscious to the, okay, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm anxious. Six weeks later, I can finally relax a little bit. It's such a, as you've experienced, such a hard mental switch to go from accumulating to spending. When you're on vacation or when you're in a mini retirement, normally you're like, how do I earn? How do I save? How do I invest? How do I grow? Right? You're in accumulation mode, but then all of a sudden you have to make the switch and you're like, now I'm supposed to spend. Normally you're... I either accumulation or your preservation, right? Offense and defense. Mm -hmm. And now you're like, well, we're chum just gonna, you know, spend the money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> bank, accounts, bank accounts going down. I had 20. Now I got 16. Now I yeah. got 14. Woo. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and when yeah. you're trained to only want the numbers to move in one direction, you're like, this is directionally yeah. not the right, you know, right. Route. And so it's, it's a, mentally a very difficult shift. I'm curious for you, Paula, because you've obviously had your own journey and gone through some different things. What would have been some of the kind of psychology of money realizations for you? Were there, were there any kind of big ahas on your own journey? Yeah, for me, the, the biggest one, when I was in my early 20s, I had a scarcity mindset. So I lacked the confidence to believe that I could make a good deal of money. And as I mentioned, I was a newspaper reporter. That's traditionally not a very high paid job, even in the best of circumstances. And my career was getting its start right at the time when Craigslist first came on the scene and decimated classified ad revenue for those of us who are old enough to remember, yeah, I remember. when when print <laughs> newspapers ran classified ads if you're under 25 a, a newspaper is you know like, uh, <laughs> actually, i actually use yellow page at the same time i have i right? used to run newspaper ads and yellow pages ads to buy houses like imagine that you know <laughs> oh wow <laughs> I'm really dating myself now <laughs> yeah we've, we've just lost the gen z audience I know. Oh, well. uh, um, but uh yeah for those of us who are still remember that you know i was coming on the scene right when class classified ad revenue was getting decimated. That was a substantial portion of print newspapers revenue. And so what that meant was that print newspapers across the board were, many of them were shutting down and the ones that were staying in business were on hiring freezes and the employees that were there were often on pay freezes. So this was an industry that was, it's already even in the best of times, a relatively low paying industry. And in addition to that, it was an industry that was in peril. I took a look at that and thought, oh my goodness, I have no confidence in my ability to ever really make a good deal of money. And so I translated that to, that means I need to clutch onto every penny. And so I was hyper, hyper, hyper frugal to the point where it was really debilitating to the point where it was something that needed to be overcome. And that's not something in our society, particularly in the personal finance niche, frugality is something that's celebrated. So to be in this space of, wait a minute, I'm too frugal. It's a problem in a subculture where frugality is something that is actively celebrated and actively encouraged. It took a lot of hitting the brakes and reversing course to learn that there's an optimal and then there's an excessive. And if you go to the excessive end, then really you're squandering time, you're squandering cognitive bandwidth, you're squandering energy and attention, you're squandering all of that in exchange for pinching a couple of extra pennies. Yeah, it reminds me, I wrote something they call the Money Life Manifesto. It was my first podcast episode actually way back in the day. And it was about Aristotle's idea of the golden mean and how every virtue, we're talking about values here and virtue, like frugality can be a virtue. But if you have this excess clutching onto money, never spending any money, you're really associating happiness with money because you're avoiding spending it and you're looking at it. But then there's an opposite. So that's an excess virtue. And then if you just spend all your money and you never pay attention to money, you're like, hey, you only live once, you know, why not spend the money? You also have a debilitating situation on either side. 
aside. So what I'm hearing from you, Paula, is that we all have personal journeys to figure this out. But if frugality can be useful, it can be the tool. Real estate investing can be useful. It can be a tool. Money can be useful if it's a tool, but it's the excesses that tend to be where we get ourselves in trouble. I know with myself as well. You were in the zone where because you were anxious about money, you had fear about money, fear about making money, the natural instinct was just to hold on to it and clutch it and spending it was, was even more difficult in right. your case. Right, exactly, exactly. There's a saying in Buddhism, it's in reference to a musical instrument, it's a metaphor for life, that if you tie the string too tightly, it'll snap. But if you tie the string too loosely, it won't play. And so that's that metaphor for maintaining that proper balance. It's a metaphor for really for all areas of life. I often hear people, particularly people who are outside of the world of personal finance and entrepreneurship and real estate investing, who will say, oh, I'm not good with money because I spend too much of it. And so there's this mainstream idea that being quote unquote good with money simply means that you are saving it, you're clutching it, you're holding on to it. And that's one idea that I think would be healthy to dispel because saving does not necessarily equate to being good with money. In fact, sometimes if the root of that saving is is an underlying fear or anxiety, you might be doing the right thing for the wrong reason. And you might be saving as a result of an underlying unhealthy relationship with money. And when you think about, you know, this is another archetype, people who are very fearful or avoidant of money. If you grew up in a household where your parents were constantly arguing about money with one another and, and you as a kid heard that, or if you said, hey, mom and dad, can we go to Disney World? And they were like, Pfft. We don't have Disney, you know, like you came to learn that money was a source of conflict or you came to learn that money was the reason that your parents were fighting. It's natural that a person might be afraid of money or avoidant of money if that's what you've learned. Given that we do have money archetypes and it's healthy to think about that, like where, where are our tendencies? Have you thought about now that, you know, you're decades into your relationship with money and earning money and you've started your own business, you've saved money, you own real estate now. How would you look at your own story now? If you had to evaluate your approach to money and your story about money, is it a healthier relationship and how would you see it? I think that a relationship that a person has to money, similar to a relationship that they have with their significant other, with themselves, with their parents, similar to any lifelong relationship is a relationship that will always have a series of peaks and valleys. There will be moments where you have a healthier relationship and moments when you have a less healthy relationship, but those will always be in flux. That's number one. And number two, in the moments in which you have a less healthy relationship, it might be less healthy in a different way. In my early 20s, my relationship with money was unhealthy because money was a source of anxiety and I was very rooted in a scarcity mindset. Now, I no longer have a scarcity mindset, but I I do think I have a bit of money avoidance. Once I accumulated enough that I don't have to be dancing on the razor's edge and I don't really have to be minding my pennies, it's easy to just kind of become avoidant of it and say, you know what, I, I don't even want to think about it. I want to focus on these other things in my life and in my world. Just like any other lifelong relationship, having a healthy relationship with money is, I think, a constant work in progress. Well said, me as well. Yeah, I think about these ideas of psychology and money. I want to keep going back to this metaphor. So we've talked about roots, values. I recommend that exercise people do that. We move up the tree and you have some of these principles that we need to understand what's going on between our ears before we even get into some of the tactics or at least along with the tactics. Eventually though, you do get to some of the, just the practical side of money. And one of the tools that you teach that I find super helpful, and I love the simplicity of it, is just this idea of how do you actually make progress on a practical basis with your money to move towards financial independence? And you have this mind the gap lesson. So let's talk about mind the gap. And then I'm going to ask a couple follow-up questions on that. Sure. So the concept of mind the gap, Oftentimes when we hear the word save, the word save has a connotation of trimming back your spending. What we're actually trying to do is we're trying to increase the gap, the distance, the delta between what we earn and what we spend. And there are only two ways to increase the gap between earning and spending. We can either earn more or we can spend less or we can do a combination of the two. But ultimately what we care about is not our quote unquote savings rate in the way that the word save is traditionally understood which is saving is normally understood as a reduction in spending. We're not worried about a reduction in spending per se. We're worried about increasing the size of the gap between what we earn and what we spend. So depending on if you make $700,000 a year and you spend $699,000 a year, there's probably some low hanging fruit there. 
right? There's probably some fairly easy ways that you can trim back and reduce your spending and thereby increase that gap. Conversely, if you make, say, 100000 a year and you increase your income to 150000 a year, well, that is proportionately, that's a huge jump in your income. And that difference, you make 150 a year. If you save all of it after taxes, then let's say, depending on what state you live in, you save $35,000, right? Jumping your income from 100 to 150, thereby saving 35 after taxes provides a significant gap that would probably, depending on what you do for work, might be easier to achieve than trying to cut $35,000 out of your spending. Yeah. So the frame is increase the gap. When you have a good principle, this is what I love about principles, is that you don't need this very specific cookie cutter tactic to tell you this is what you should do. You take the principle. If you want to have financial independence, if you want to grow your wealth, have a big gap between your earnings and your savings. And then you can apply that like as a lens on your life and say, what's the most optimal way for me to increase my gap right now? And for somebody who you're the journalist making $22,000 a year or me, the right out of college, just trying to like flip a house or two, earning more income is the big deal. Like I do need to get a hold of my frugality just to make sure I don't go out of business, you know, lose money and go bankrupt. But, you know, after that's taken care of, then it's almost like if you were a business owner, which we all are, right? We would look at not investing in growth as a mistake. Like we would say, hey, we can't just maintain this low income for the rest of our business. To be successful, we'd have to increase our income. We'd have to invest in so that lens, you can apply that to wherever you are in life. I love the universality of that. Like, So the $699,000 spending person, they clearly need to focus on savings. They could go make another 100000 as well, maybe. But for them to be sustainable and have some kind of flexibility and freedom, spending less is going to be probably their path. Us in our 20s, let's go make an extra 50000 bucks because, man, that's going to really yeah, move us forward as well. I think you said that very well. You know, you, you look through that lens and ask yourself at this current point in time, and of course, these answers are going to change depending on your current situation in life. But at this current point in time, what's the most optimal way to increase that gap? So you grow the gap, then you invest the gap, and then you repeat. That's the three-step process of minding the gap. Grow the gap, invest the gap, repeat. All right, I'm going to get to invest the gap here in a second, but there's one other tool that you have that I just love the simplicity of it. I was someone early in my career who I, I got some value out of doing a budget of having the Dave Ramsey cash flow envelopes. My wife and I did that right when we got married. I don't do that anymore. It's just too much work. I found that to be helpful. But I know a lot of friends and a lot of people who will never, ever, do that. It's just too nerdy. It's too much. It's too much. It's some extra effort. You talk about something called an anti-budget, which you've applied for yourself, which I've actually used in my business as well. I want you to explain that because I find for people who have a hard time with the mechanics of saving, this could be such a helpful tool for them. I developed the anti-budget because of the frustrations and the limitations around traditional budgeting. So first of all, traditional budgeting is like calorie counting. It is onerous. It requires being meticulous. It requires a huge input of time and attention. If you are diligently tracking every single calorie and macro that goes in your mouth across the course of a day, which of course requires weighing and measuring everything that you consume and probably never eating at a restaurant unless you know the exact nutritional guidelines of what's being served at that restaurant, that's an incredibly demanding task. And it's not one that most people can do long term. I know people who have done it for a couple of weeks, for a couple of months even, just to get a baseline, but I don't think I know or even know other of anyone who has consistently done it for, let's say, 10 years. It's an uphill battle. You're, you're moving against the natural inclination of most people. That's, yeah. that's just the fact. Yeah. What happens the first time you go to Chipotle? If traditional budgeting is the calorie counting of personal finance, then the anti-budget is the intuitive eating of personal finance. And the way it works is as follows. With the anti-budget, your first step is to decide how much you want to save. And in this context, I'm using the word save to mean any improvement in your net worth. So it could be making contributions to a retirement account. It could be making additional payments on a debt above and beyond the minimum required. It could be literal savings in a savings account, but any improvement to your net worth is what I mean when I use the word save. So step one is decide how much you want to save. Step two is to pull that off the top first. And then step three is to just spend the rest without worrying about excessive line itemization because a traditional budget requires us to line itemize all of our expenses such that we know exactly how much we spent on toothpaste versus Taylor Swift tickets. And the problem with that, all right, if it's something like Taylor Swift tickets, it's very clear that falls into the entertainment line item category. But you go to Target, you buy some bread and milk, but you also buy some clothes and then you also get a magazine. Do you parse out your Target receipt or do you create a separate category that's called Target, right? And if three, so, 
three yeah. shopping carts, Paula. You got to have three shopping carts and put all the different items. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> How could you ever truly track your grocery spending if part of that grocery spending comes from the Target run and part of it, there's like canned sardines and tuna that you order from Amazon. So first of all, there's just the logistical hurdle of how do you parse out expenses that are multi-category? That's question number one. And then number two is, does it even matter? Do you really care how much you're spending on groceries versus clothing versus your insurances? If at the end of the day, the fundamental question that you are trying to answer is, am I setting aside enough money for my goals? If that's the fundamental question that you're trying to answer, then why not just shoot for the objective? If that's what you want to do, then do that first and don't worry about the rest. As a human being, we have to sort of, I mentioned going uphill, but if you want to align with what's naturally easy for us to do. And so I'm, I imagine with the anti-budget, you set aside, let's say you make 5,000 bucks this month, you know you're going to save a thousand bucks. You have 4,000 bucks to spend. You could just do a cash accounting. You could just say, how much money do I, you could look pretty quickly at your, your bank account and say, I've got 500 bucks left in my bank account. Whether you have toothpaste or magazines or insurance or whatever you have in there, like that's how much money you have to spend. And then you can have real time behavior modification as as opposed to, it's really difficult to envision what your budget is going to be. And here's the category in real time to do it. Like real time behavior modification is so tricky, so difficult without someone looking over your shoulders or counting every calorie. Like I, I find that whether it's your food, nutrition, or your, your money, that's a very difficult task. Exactly. You know, because then what do you do? You get the text message from a friend that you haven't heard from in a while and they say, hey, short notice, but my birthday is on Friday. Do you want to come out to this restaurant with us? And you know, oh, geez, in my budget, I have already spent my restaurant allocation for the month, but I do have additional money in my clothing allocation, you know, what are you going to sit there on a spreadsheet and rework the budget? It just, why not just have one mega budget? Fundamentally, the anti-budget is a two category budget. There's what you save in the broadest sense of the word, and then there's what you spend and that's yeah. it. I like it. I love, so simple, yet so powerful. I know some people just getting the early days of savings is really difficult. And so you have another principle, which is helpful there, like especially people who have a lot of student debt, for example, or you know, you're just digging your, your way out of some financial challenges you had. We've all started somewhere. Not all of us are starting with a lot of money landing on our lap. You had to dig your own way out. If you're saving zero, like how do you even get your head around, you know, all these financial independence people are saving 50% of their money and I'm not saving anything and I have a lot of debt. What would be the way you start using the anti-budget without getting overwhelmed? by it. This is another concept that I coined that's called the 1% challenge. And so with the 1% challenge, whatever your current savings rate is, let's say you're saving zero. This month, I want you to save 1% of your income, one additional percent above whatever your current rate is. So 1% is $10 per every thousand dollars that you make. So if you make 5,000 a month, it's 50 bucks. You make 10,000 a month, it's a hundred bucks. Whatever it is that you're currently saving this month, save an additional 1%. Next month, save one more percent. The month after that, one more percent. So if you continue this, if you start today and you continue this for a year, then a year from now, you have just increased your savings rate by an additional 12%. You know, because you've done it incrementally month by month, it's not a cold plunge, right? It's a slow wading into the waters. And so you're able to adjust your lifestyle accordingly, month by month, piece by piece. It's going to feel slow because oftentimes when people start, they have a lot of beginner's enthusiasm. And so that first month, you don't want to just only save 1%. You, you want to save 10%. So in the beginning, it's going to feel slow. But with money, like with food or nutrition or exercise, consistency matters more than intensity. If you exercise intensely for one month and then you're sedentary for the next 11 months because you burned yourself out in month one, you're not going to ultimately a year from now have done yourself any favors. By contrast, if you exercise consistently, even with less intensity, but you maintain it for 12 months, you're going to do yourself a lot more. And that's the same principle that's at, in force here with the 1% challenge. It's slow, it's consistent, and over time, it aggregates into a really big behavioral change. You know, for the 44 year olds in the room like me, you go out to exercise for the first week and you try to exercise like you did in college and you hurt your back and now you're leaning over like this and you're like embarrassed about that. And yeah. so you, you don't want to, you don't want to hurt your proverbial savings back when you go and uh, jump up to 25% on the first rep, right? You don't want to you know, work your way up. It is so difficult. This is another psychological issue. Like we get in our own way. I get in my own way because you have this expectation of this is what other people are doing. And this is that you compare yourself to them. And I should have been saving for the last five years 
years and I haven't been saving and therefore you have to catch up quickly. That's our impediment. That voice that's in our head, going back to that psychology of money, like that is the biggest, it's the practical stuff's pretty simple. Like I, I love how your principles are so simple that you can like, overlook them, but the application of them is the tricky part. Exactly. And so the behaviorally, the less friction that you can associate with a given behavior change, the more likely that change is to stick. And so with something like the 1% challenge, because it is a low friction behavior modification tool, it just has a higher likelihood of sticking, you know, versus if you were to tell yourself, well, I'm never going to any restaurant ever again. And when my friend texts me and says, hey, it's my birthday on Friday, I'm going to tell them, nope, sorry, can't make it. That might work for a couple of weeks, but then all your friends are mad at you and then they stop inviting you places and then you're lonely. It's not something that you can or should want to maintain for the long term. It's an unhealthy approach. Whereas if you were to take that much more gradual, low friction behavior modification route, you may feel as though you're underestimating what you can achieve in a week, but you will be in a drastically different place in a year. So if we follow everything we've talked about up to now, we've written down some values, we've done our stick diagram of a tree, we have much more clarity on you know what, what we're trying to accomplish, what matters to us. We have some principles that we've applied as we moved up the tree and we've even started saving money. We're setting some money aside. We're making some progress, slow but steady. The other half of that, mind the gap, is a big topic we could talk a lot about. And we do talk about on both our podcasts a lot of investing, of earning money, investing in real estate. I'm just left from a high level, Paula. Like you and I both invest in real estate. People know that. I also invest in the stock market. I talk about that very little. I also have businesses on the side. I would love just your perspective for people on those three options, like just general investing, real estate, businesses. How do you you think about those and how do you compare when a person should focus on one or the other of those options? So I think of the acronym FIRE and I have a my own definition of the FIRE acronym and that is financial psychology, investing, real estate, entrepreneurship. And so financial psychology is foundational. It's where we start. And that is what we talked about at the beginning of the show. It is really getting clear about your values, your principles, your dreams, and then the strategies that you're going to implement in order to reach those dreams. It's also improving and healing your relationship with money and understanding what some of your limitations are. You know, there, there's head, heart, and hands, right? So while the hands might be the things that you do, like behavior modification, as we just discussed, the heart component of it are your emotions around money. Are you anxious? Are you afraid? Are you excessively worshipful? Are you uh, hypervigilant, right? It's understanding the feelings that arise when issues related to money come up. And then the head component of it, of course, are like, what are your cognitive biases? You know, are you particularly prone to loss aversion, which means that you feel the pain of an investment loss more than you feel the joy of the gain? All of that bundles together into that very, very first step, which is financial psychology. And that's the foundation of everything. Once you've completed the F, now you can go to the, the IR a fire and that ire investing real estate entrepreneurship it's perfect i think that real estate is in the center of the two because i see real estate as a hybrid between investing and entrepreneurship so it's perfect that it's also positioned as the middle letter in terms of what is necessary the, the phi is necessary financial psychology and investing that part is necessary at a minimum everyone needs to be investing for retirement if you do absolutely nothing else Everyone needs to be investing for retirement. And then the RE portion is optional. The real estate is optional. Entrepreneurship is optional. If you want to add them in, they're great. But FI is critical. RE is optional. Similar to financial independence, retire early, in which the FI, financial independence, is the root of it. And then the retire early, you know, that that's optional. You don't have to retire early. It's an option that's available to you. But if you're not interested in doing it, then don't do it. Same thing. Real estate and entrepreneurship are options, but financial psychology and investing, those are critical foundations. How do you balance those in your own personal journey? I know you you invest in real estate. Maybe just briefly, what does what yeah. your real estate approach or strategy look like? So I am the small and mighty real estate investor. Nice. <laughs> I've heard of that. <laughs> Currently, I have seven rental units, all of which are paid off free and clear. And I know there's going to be people throwing tomatoes at their listening device right now. <laughs> not going. on this channel, not on this channel. We're, we're good with it. <laughs> the reason that I personally chose to do that, even though I know that that is, you know, paying off low interest loans is considered by many to be foolish. The reason that I personally chose to do that is because I am not a W-2 employee of any other company besides my own. If I were a tenured professor and I had an enormous amount of job security, I would be happy to take on big risks in my approach to real estate investing. But because my primary focus is to be an entrepreneur, 
to run my own small business, there is inherently a huge level of volatility in my day-to-day work. And because there's so much volatility and risk in my day job, I chose to lower the, the risk profile of my real estate portfolio so that, you know, by, by virtue of being more conservative in my real estate investments, I can be more aggressive in the private company that I am growing. So that's the reason that I decided I would pay off all of my properties free and clear. So I've I've got seven units. Um, They're all residential, long-term buy and hold, all paid free and clear. And those are split across three states. So I've got Nevada, Indiana, and Georgia. So besides that, I have investments. I've got a solo 401k. I have a Roth backdoor Roth IRA. I have a taxable brokerage account. I have a health savings account. So I've got market investments in all of those in the form of passively managed index funds. Personally, I take, and I don't necessarily recommend this for most people, but personally, I take what's known as a barbell allocation, which means I don't have a bond allocation. I have all of my market investments in equities. And then I have also a heavy cash allocation. I do. I do something very similar. Just, it's just kind of been my, it wasn't anything, you know, I don't know where academically where I picked that up, but just practically for my real estate business, I always stashed away a bunch of cash and had huge reserves. And then very similar to your approach there that then you have the, the risk of owning leveraged real estate. I always just felt was like, very, I felt the stress of that. So having a big pile of cash kind of to go along with that made a ton of sense. And so I've sort of looked at the long-term allocation of my portfolio. Similarly, I also, another conversation, look at some of my income, my properties as bond like when they're free and clear. So, I, you know, when I pay off a, a hundred thousand dollar mortgage, I'm essentially taking the place of that mortgage, which is a bond. So I've, I've sort of looked at that allocation of my portfolio as more bond like anyway. I have exactly that same framework where residential long-term buy and hold rental properties to me are, that's an income play. And what is a bond? A bond is, tr- it's an income play. It's the income portion of your portfolio. So to me, that's what my rental properties are. And then the E for entrepreneurship, that's where I spend most of my time, energy focus goes there. And that comes from building out Afford Anything. It comes from, we have an online course that we offer. And Chad, I know you have some excellent courses as well, but you know how much time, effort, money, goes into growing, maintaining, updating, scaling, administering those courses. And so that to me is, is my primary focus. Yeah. Maybe just to to wrap this all up, I think it's beautiful to, to kind of go full circle that, you know, a part of the psychology of money for me personally, and what I've learned from you and observing is that ultimately, you know, we're trying to build and architect this life that we have options to do things on. And I love creation. I love podcasting. I love having conversations like this. I love teaching. Those are, those are my if you want to call it a calling, you know, like the things that really just move you, move me, that my outside looking in, it seems like you're a very creative person. And I highly recommend people check out your podcast, your course that you have for buying your first rental property. You do great work. And Thank so it's, it's fun, fun to watch friends who are on a similar journey, who get to spend their time doing the things that matter to them. And you just travel to Mongolia and to China <laughs> and across the world. And you're also running a business. To me, yeah. uh, you know, we all have our individual, like unique paths, but I think it's fun to share with people what some of the possibilities are and the psychology and the mechanics and the tactics. Those are all foundations upon which you can build a really amazing life for yourself. And I don't know, do you have any final words for people, just encouragement for them if they want to take a similar path or their own path, but they want to have the options to do some of the things that you're doing and that I'm getting to do as well. Yeah, I would say just think very carefully about what matters most to you and what doesn't. Because if you do want to take this path, if you want to start a business of your own or you want to buy rental properties, that's going to require both time and money. And that time and money has to come from somewhere. And you want to be sure that the things that you are sacrificing are not going to later be deathbed regrets. So if you, for example, the root of your tree is you value your relationships with friends and family, then go to your friend's birthday party on Friday night, even though that means, you know, it's going to be a hundred dollar restaurant bill. Go to that, spend the money there, but cut that money from some other area of your budget. Maybe, maybe you don't actually care about wearing nice clothes and you're perfectly fine having a handful of shirts that you just wear again and again and again. If that's how you feel, I mean, for those of you watching on YouTube, look, I've got a stained (laughs) sweater, right? You can, you can see it right here. I'm still, I I don't care. It's a tiny stain. I'm still wearing it because I could easily afford to replace this sweater, but it is not a priority. I'm happy with it. It's not a priority, but I'm also at this very moment in Texas because I wanted to come here to watch the eclipse because watching the eclipse is a huge priority. So perfect example of, I personally don't care about clothing. I'm not going to spend money there. I do care about travel, particularly for something like watching an eclipse. I will spend money there. And so that's what I would recommend to you. If you know, you're 
going to be pulling that time and money from somewhere. Be very clear about where you will pull it from and conversely, where you won't pull it from. What are the things that are so important to you that you're not going to cut back in those areas? Beautifully said. Always enjoy talking to you, Paula. Thank you for coming on to talk on the podcast again. I'm going to put links to Afford Anything, to your website, to your podcast, to your course as well. And I hope people check that out and connect with you. And I look forward to talking to you again sometime in the here in the future. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. In this interview, you might have heard Paula say that she's paid off all of her properties. She has no more debt. I've also done that on many of my rental properties. So if that's something you'd like to do now or someday, watch my next episode, How to Pay Your Rental Properties Off Early Using the rental debt snowball. If you're watching on YouTube, you can click the thumbnail above me here, or you can click on the link in the podcast or YouTube description below. See you in the next video.